At 3 a.m., the freezing serenity of Novorossiysk, the Russian Black Sea Fleet's safest harbor, is shattered by the sound every sailor fears the collision alarm. On the radar screens, 12 fast-moving contacts appear out of nowhere, sprinting toward the harbor mouth at 50 knots. These are Ukrainian Sea Baby surface drones, each carrying enough explosives to crack a destroyer in half. The Russian response is instantaneous and violent. The shore-based Panzer air defense systems level their guns horizontally and open fire. From the decks of the anchored warships, Tor M2 batteries join the choir, launching interceptors at point-blank range. In exactly eight minutes, it is over. Twelve drones are now burning wreckage, sinking to the bottom of the harbor. The radar screen is wiped clean. The crew on the pier high-five each other. They send the code to Moscow. Threat neutralized. Port secure. The searchlights dim. The active sonar pings slow down as the operators go on a smoke break. They pat themselves on the back, thinking the show is over. But they made a fatal calculation. They looked at the explosion, not the logic. The 12 surface drones that just died in a blaze of glory were not the attack. They were the distraction. While the Russians were busy shooting at the noise, six brand new Toloka underwater submersible drones slipped past the outer perimeter. They are silent electric and invisible to radar. The real hunt begins now. At 0315 a.m., the harbor returns to an eerie calm. The active sonar pings from the destroyers slow down, shifting from a frantic search beat to a lazy rhythmic pulse. The Russian operators adjust their headphones, their ears ringing from the earlier chaos, completely unaware that the real threat is already inside the house. 20 miles out, six specialized underwater drones engage their propulsion systems. Unlike their surface cousins, these machines don't roar. They whisper. Powered by high-torque electric motors, they glide through the water with the acoustic signature of a drifting log. Each drone carries a 500-pound high-explosive warhead, guided not by a human hand, but by an onboard AI running on inertial navigation. They don't need GPS, they don't need radio signals, they just need a path. And the Russians, in their zeal to destroy the surface decoys, inadvertently gave them one. The massive shockwaves from the earlier surface explosions didn't just kill the decoys. They rocked the harbor's heavy anti-torpedo nets. The steel mesh designed to stop submarines has shifted just enough to create a six-foot gap near the seabed. It is a tiny window, but for these six mechanical sharks, it is an open door. At 0322 AM, inside of the harbor acoustic room, a Russian operator watching a passive sonar waterfall display freezes. His headphones pick up a faint low-frequency anomaly. It is a mechanical hum, barely registering above the background static. He screams, contact below low-speed movement in Sector 4. The base defense doesn't hesitate. They initiate the anti-saboteur protocol. The active sonar arrays on the pier kick into maximum power, blasting the water with 235 decibels of acoustic energy. It is a sensory brute force attack, instantly stripping away the invisibility cloak of the Ukrainian machines. Simultaneously, the automated DP-65 grenade launcher system mounted on the pier swings into action. This isn't a soldier with a gun, it is a robotic turret linked directly to the sonar. It calculates the lead angle and spits out a 10-round salvo of RG-55 high-explosive grenades. The small charges arc through the air and splash into the water in a perfect killing circle around the contact point. They sink to a preset depth of 40 feet and detonate. Physics takes over. Because water is effectively incompressible, the shock waves don't dissipate. They travel at 3-300 miles per hour, hitting with the force of a hydraulic press. The lead two Toloka drones are caught in the overpressure zone. The shockwave slams into their composite hulls, shattering their delicate optical sensors and cracking their battery compartments. On the Ukrainian control screens, two video feeds instantly glitch into static and die. The Russians have drawn first blood. The score is 1-0 for the Kremlin. But the Russian celebration is premature. They believe they are fighting standard dumb torpedoes. They are wrong. Meet the Toloka TLK-1000. This is Ukraine's newest proprietary nightmare for the Black Sea Fleet. Unlike a traditional torpedo that runs in a straight line until it hits something or runs out of fuel, the Toloka is a loitering munition for the underwater world. It has a range of 1,200 miles and is powered by a silent electric drive. The Russians just spent their best ammo destroying the scouts, unaware that the real hunters are still circling in the dark, and they are about to execute a maneuver that no standard torpedo could ever perform. At 03.26 AM, 
The Rushton Harbor commander proves he is not an amateur. He realizes the noisy targets might be a feint. He orders the Grakenok class anti-saboteur ship to deploy its ace in the hole the Marlin 350 remote operated vehicle. This is a small yellow submersible tethered by a fiber optic cable equipped with high intensity LED floodlights and a high resolution camera. It dives into the black water like a mechanical bloodhound. Simultaneously, a Raptor patrol boat races over the suspected sector and rolls two BB-1 heavy depth charges off its stern racks. When these charges detonate, they don't produce a fireball. They produce a pressure spike of 1 500 pounds per square inch. The water acts like a solid hammer. The shockwave catches one of the four surviving Taloka drones. The impact is brutal. It snaps the drone's carbon fiber stabilizer fins and cracks the seal on its battery compartment. Salt water rushes in, shorting out the main bus. The drone dies instantly, spiraling uselessly into the mud. Three drones remain, but their cover is blown. The Marlin ROV reaches the seabed. Its lights sweep through the murky darkness, illuminating the silt like a flashlight in a dusty attic. Then the operator on the surface sees it. On his monitor, the sharp black silhouette of a Taloka drone glides past the camera just feet away from the massive rubber-coated hull of the Kilo submarine. The operator screams into his headset, visual contact object attached to the hull. This is the ultimate wager. If the ROV operator can guide a precision depth charge onto that spot in the next 30 seconds, the mission fails. If the submarine crew blows their emergency ballast tanks, they can surface and use the hull itself to deflect the blast. The Ukrainians are out of time, out of stealth, and facing a confirmed kill order. At 0327 AM, the operator in Kiev makes the hardest call in drone warfare. He types a single command line, execute sacrifice protocol. One of the three surviving Taloka drones instantly breaks its stealth profile. It doesn't run away. It turns directly toward the Russian Marlin ROV and the patrol boat above it. It revs its electric motor to 2000 RPM, creating a screaming acoustic signature that drowns out everything else in the harbor. On the Russian surface ship, the tactical officer takes the bait. He sees a high-speed contact rushing his position. Panic overrides discipline. He screams engagement and releases the second heavy depth charge right on top of the ROV's position. The explosion is massive. The underwater shockwave vaporizes the sacrificial Ukrainian drone. It also crushes the $200,000 Russian ROV like a soda can and blasts a crater in the harbor floor. The water is churned into a blinding, deafening soup of mud and bubbles. For the next 10 seconds, every sonar screen in Novorossiysk is white out blind. That 10 seconds is all the remaining two Taloka drones need. While the Russians are celebrating the kill of the decoy, the real assassins' drones, Charlie and Delta, glide silently through the turbidity cloud. They approach the Kilo-class submarine from the stern slipping into its baffles, the cone of silence behind the propeller where the sub's own sonar cannot see. They drift under the massive black steel belly of the three 900-ton vessel. Drone Charlie targets the midship section directly beneath the lithium-ion battery compartment. Drone Delta targets the engineering space near the propeller shaft. The Russian acoustic officer finally clears his screen of the static. He sees two faint dots merging with the submarine's hull signature. He reaches for the alarm button, his mouth opening to scream, BRACE! He is half a second too late. The proximity fuses on both drones trigger simultaneously. 1,000 pounds of Torch X high explosive detonates in direct contact with the pressure hull. The game of cat and mouse is over. The trap has snapped. At 0327 and one second, physics delivers its verdict. When 1,000 pounds of high explosive detonates underwater against a submarine, a terrifying phenomenon occurs. It is called the tamping effect. Because water is 800 times denser than air, it refuses to move out of the way quickly. It acts like a solid wall, forcing 90% of the explosive energy to travel the path of least resistance. That path is the air-filled steel tube of the Kilo-class submarine. The blast wave hits the pressure hull at 26,000 feet per second. The HY-80 steel designed to withstand the crushing depths of the ocean is useless against a point-blank kinetic hammer of this magnitude. It doesn't just crack, it shears. A hole the size of a minivan is punched instantly through the double hull. But the explosion is only the beginning. The real destruction comes from the bubble. The detonation creates a massive superheated gas bubble that expands rapidly, pushing the water back. 
A split second later, the surrounding water pressure crushes this bubble back in on itself. This collapse creates a secondary shockwave, a water hammer that hits the submarine even harder than the explosion itself. Inside the vessel, the devastation is absolute. The submarine acts like a shaken soda can that just had its side ripped open. The sudden rush of seawater enters at a pressure of 40 psi. It slams into the forward battery compartment. This is where chemistry takes over. The Kilo class runs on massive banks of lead acid or lithium ion batteries. When salt water hits charged battery terminals, it creates an immediate short circuit generating thousands of amps of electricity. The water undergoes rapid electrolysis, splitting into hydrogen and oxygen gas, an explosive mixture waiting for a spark. And there are plenty of sparks. A secondary explosion erupts from inside the submarine. A geyser of white foam, black oil, and battery acid shoots 50 feet into the air rocking the concrete pier like an earthquake. The Russian sailors on the dock are knocked off their feet. The shock wave rattles the windows of the harbor master's office three miles away. Then the fire starts. Not a fire that air can extinguish, but a chemical fire that burns underwater. The magnesium components in the torpedo room ignite burning at 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The heat is so intense it warps the steel frames of the caliber cruise missiles stored in the forward tubes. The propellant inside the missiles begins to cook off, venting poisonous gas into the dying ship. For the submarine, buoyancy is a math equation, weight versus displacement. The equation just broke. With millions of gallons of water rushing in, the 3,000-ton vessel loses the fight against gravity in seconds. The bow pitches down sharply. The stern lifts momentarily, the massive seven-blade propeller spinning uselessly in the air, dripping with mud and oil before slamming back down. At 0329 a.m., the surface of the harbor settles. The improved Kilo-class submarine, the Black Hole of the Russian Navy, has lived up to its nickname in the worst way possible. It has vanished. Where a $425 million strategic asset sat just two minutes ago, there is now only a churning vortex of oily bubbles and floating debris. The Russian base commander stands on the pier, staring at the empty berth, his face illuminated by the emergency strobe lights. He is looking for a submarine that is now resting on the harbor floor. It's back broken, it's batteries burning, and it's war over. The silence that follows is heavier than the explosion. The port is secure, but the fleet is broken. The sun rises over Novorossiysk, revealing a harbor that smells of burnt diesel and humiliation. But the sinking of one submarine is just the first tile in a domino effect that is about to crash through the entire Russian Navy. Let's talk about the operational paralysis. The Black Sea Fleet just lost a primary caliber truck. That Kilo-class submarine wasn't just a boat. It was a mobile launch platform capable of firing four cruise missiles in a single salvo from underwater where air defense couldn't touch it. By deleting this asset, Ukraine didn't just sink 3,000 tons of steel. They removed 25% of Russia's underwater missile capacity in the Black Sea. The remaining three submarines in the fleet are no longer predators. They are targets. They can no longer dock in Novorossiysk with impunity. They are forced to retreat further east to the port of Oshamchiri and occupied Georgia. This is a logistical nightmare. Every mile they retreat adds hours to their reload times and reduces their time on station. It is like Amazon losing its main distribution center and trying to deliver packages to New York from a warehouse in Alaska. The efficiency of the Russian missile blockade has just been slashed by a third. Then comes the collapse of credibility. At 8 a.m., the Russian Ministry of Defense releases a statement. An attempted terrorist attack on the naval base was successfully repelled. No damage to fleet assets. At R08.05 a.m., Ukrainian intelligence uploads a 4K video to Telegram. It is the onboard footage from Drone Charlie, transmitted seconds before impact. The video clearly shows the hull number of the submarine, the panic on the pier, and the final fatal plunge toward the propeller shaft. The internet does the rest. Satellite imagery confirms a massive oil slick where the submarine used to be. The denial becomes a meme. The psychological shrapnel is even worse than the explosive kind. Russian commanders start reacting with paranoia. Satellite photos from the next day show Russian crews painting two-dimensional silhouettes of submarines on the concrete piers. It is a wild E. Coyote level of desperation trying to trick Ukrainian satellites into thinking the empty spots are occupied, hoping the drones will attack the pavement instead of the real ships. It is the military equivalent of hiding a gunshot wound with a band-aid. 
let's look at the final return on investment for this night. Ukraine spent roughly $2 million on 12 surface decoys and 6 underwater prototypes. Russia lost a $425 million submarine, 12 expensive torpedoes, dozens of depth charges, and most expensive of all the concept of a safe harbor. The lesson from Novorossiysk is brutal. In modern naval warfare, there is no rear guard. If you can float, you can sink. Ukraine has proven that you don't need a navy to destroy a navy. You just need patience, AI, and the willingness to sacrifice a few pawns to kill the king. So here is the question for you. If you were the Ukrainian operator, knowing the Russians are now on high alert, how many sea babies would you send in the next wave to ensure a kill? 10, 50? Or would you switch tactics entirely? Let me know your battle plan in the comments below. I'll pin the best strategy in the next video. Don't forget to like if you think the age of the big battleship is over and subscribe to see what happens when 21st century tech meets Cold War Steel. See you in the next deep dive.